Um, I'm Alice Taylor. I teach at West Los Angeles College, one of the nine Los Angeles community colleges. I teach humanities and art history. My training is in art history. I have a doctorate in medieval art, very esoteric. Um, but I, uh, I love teaching community college. I love the, the drive that the students have to, to really get someplace and they're, they're, uh, they're really into it. Um, one of their problems is paying for textbooks. So I've been very interested in open educational resources for quite a while. And I was happy to participate in a little study that uh, Cal State ran on how an open educational resource would work in a, in a class. So I added um, some bits of, from smart history to my humanities survey. Smart History is a project of a couple of New York art historians, Beth Harris and Stephen Zucker, both PhDs. And they started by doing little podcasts in museums around New York. They would go and stand in front of an object and chat about it. And then they branched into videos and set up this website, Smart History, where they're offering this sort of little conversation in front of an artwork to whoever wants to do it, wants to participate. And that was then taken on by the Khan Academy. And I think they now actually work for Khan Academy. It's kind of an ideal job. They travel around the world and stand around and talk about art. <laughs> they really, and they seem to be enjoying it. And now they're bringing in more experts. Um, I gather from what they talk about that they're either classicists or medievalists. Um, and it's it's growing so it's a very dynamic um resource it is in a sense a textbook um it's breath that if you are willing to poke around you can you could put together an entire art history class from smart history but you'd have to you know it, it leaves you to have the vision of what it is that you want to do it's not laid out which I like that it's it offers you a lot of resources and for this project I used videos of which there are quite a quite a lot of videos but they've also got short articles and a couple of timelines and some quizzes that are basically because they're wide open and they're not very big they're multiple choice but they're not um, they're not dynamic you know everybody gets the same questions so they're, they would be good for students to practice with, maybe. You never see them, though. Um, it is, it's as if you're standing between Dr. Harris and Dr. Zucker. Oh. And sometimes another person, they bring in an extra uh, expert, um, talking about some, some building or some sculpture, some painting, um, the various things they talk about. Yeah, this is a page in my, um, my course site. This was my humanities course last semester. It's in um, the course management system that West is, has used for 17 years, which is ETUDES, stands for easy to use distance education software. We are in the section of it that they call modules, which is sort of the lecture area. And that's where I embedded some of the, um, a couple of the videos from Smart History. So here's a section of the module where I'm using the module to ask the students to prepare for a discussion that is a, a written discussion um, about the Parthenon. So I've got the prompt that I would like them to pay attention to these specific claims about the Parthenon, that it has dynamism, it looks organic, it conveys a sense of wealth, it conveys a sense of power. And I've embedded in here the video um, from 
smart history. So if I click on this, we'll hear it. Shall we hear it? It's got a little piano music. It's at the Khan Academy. We're looking at the Parthenon. This is a huge marble temple to the goddess Athena. Completely online class. I don't see these students at all. So they're just, they're, the discussion that takes place is written. There is, so what I'm having them do is go to a um, discussion area and respond to one of these prompts. So they've, they've, they've listened to the video, watched it, I hope a few times. They've thought about what kind of evidence was presented to support these opinions that the Parthenon has dynamism or whatever. And then I'm, I'm again telling them, reminding them what I'm asking them to write about. And they are then, I can't get rid of their names. They're, they're writing about what they, what they see in it. I'm not sure it's, it's a, it's a problem with, with an online course that it's, you can't hear the students, you know, talking among themselves. You can't, you know, you're, it's a much more formal exchange of, um, you know, I ask a question, they answer the question, they ask a question, I answer the question. So you miss a lot of that um, sense of what's going on. I, I wanted to use the videos, and I have actually used some smart history videos in an art history class as well, because I wanted, um, for one thing, to, to not have that art history problem that you're reading the text and it says look at the image. So you have to train the art historian to put, put your finger where you are, hold your place, and go find the image and look at it and see if you can see what they're talking about. So this allows, this doesn't, this, if you're using the subtitles, they're right in front of you and you see the image. And uh, one of the things that's nice about smart history is that they've, they've really, and they've gotten better at this as the site has developed, that they do put in front of you visually what they're talking about. And you don't have that stop and go see what it's about. Now that's a skill that you want to um, develop in your, if somebody's going to be an art history major, but I don't think it's the major uh, out learning outcome that we want from, from a humanities class or the introduction to art history. You want them to, to see, you want them to understand that when you look at something, you can get something out of it that isn't reading, it's actually getting something it's, it's, it's this visual exchange of information and feelings. So these videos make that much more seamless. And I was hoping that it would improve their discussion of the architecture, but it didn't. It, they did, uh, there's choice in, in the uh, discussions and there's intentional choice that I give. And then there's, they can just decide not to do something and, and uh, if something seems more important. And, I, and there, was, there were more students participated in the discussion of architecture than, than had before. So there was, that was good. This only expanded because I, um, the students still had to buy a textbook that sort of gave the historical overview and provided the literature that we were talking about. But having done it, um, I decided that I'm going to, the next time I teach the class next fall, I'm going to use all free online material. It's an online class in the first place. So there's, although I think I'm also going to try to include a lot of PDFs so they can print things up and write on them because I thought of this great video the other day about how important it is to be able to interact physically, you know, with, 
with your online material. Um, I don't think people are used to writing on images, but uh, people who are used to annotating their texts, it's a good way of reading. So I'll try to include some stuff they can annotate, they can easily print out. Suggest to them also what they should print, providing. Here, print out this poem. You're going to need, it, need to read it carefully. I'm not offering that you can print out all of this background information because it's, it's just background information. You know, ready to go with getting the whole, getting all the materials for this, for this class, which runs from earliest times through the Middle Ages to using only online materials. It's, it's a pretty easy area to do it in because there are great museums with great websites and there are, um, there's a lot of translated literature that's um, been put on the web. A lot easier than if you're doing something modern where you have to deal with copyright. Sort of no excuse to not do it, I think.